Last night's drama, White House Farm, continued on ITV, and in just a moment, we're going to be talking all about that. It's based on a true story, one that has had a lasting impact for all those involved. In 1985, the brutal murder of five members of the same family shocked the nation. On the 6th of August, Jeremy Bamber walked into the family farmhouse in Essex and shot dead his parents, June and Neville, his sister Sheila, and her six-year-old twins, Daniel and Nicholas. Bamber was later convicted of their killing, but not before he attempted to pin the murder of the family on his sister Sheila. Bamber claimed he received a desperate phone call on the night of the attack from his father, saying his sister had gone mad with a shotgun. A claim that was initially believed, but suspicion later fell on Bamber. When he was taken to court, accused of the murder, it was his girlfriend's testimony that convinced the jury he had indeed planned the murder of the family. Bamba was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, but the murders left a trail of devastation behind them for family and friends. Family that included the father of Sheila's twins, her ex-husband, Colin Caffell. And Colin, who we mentioned there, is with us now. Thank you for joining yeah, us. Good morning. Joining us this um, morning, Colin. You were 32 at the time. We had custody of the twins. You'd taken Sheila and the boys to the farm for that weekend. Um, obviously, with no knowledge of the horror that was about to be unfolded within your life. No. Was it a one of those fateful knocks at the door? It was a terrible knock at the door. Um, you know, so suddenly everything's fine. You're planning to, you know, a holiday. I was going to take the twins to Norway for a, to, to visit their cousins, and just getting things ready. And uh, opened the door to two police women. And uh, and so for you, this is the beginning of this period that you went through of total shock, obviously, but also denial. Well, absolutely, yes. It's um, I went through all the sort of classic stages of. of, of grieving, mm -hmm. um, but denial and bargaining were the first two, trying to pretend it didn't happen. Um, I was trying to hang on to my positive memories of the twins. Mm. So I immediately, I, I was in shock, but at the same time, I didn't want anybody to tell me anything. So I, I kind of walked straight into all Jeremy's lies. Right. And believed them to start off with. Um, well, the, the media sadly very had a- seductive. Had yeah. a, yes, yeah. uh, had a field day at mm -hmm. the expense of, of Sheila. Yeah. Um, she, was, she was portrayed as a drug addict, uh, mentally ill, a violent killer. I mean, the papers yeah. were absolutely full of it. And that was all based on the opinions of people in the village who actually didn't know her. You know, just people couldn't wait to get in front of a TV camera or, or um, a, a, a reporter. Mm. Um, but she was mentally ill. She was heavily medicated uh, for, that, for that illness. Mm. She was an ex-model. Um, but they just turned, they had, they had a spree because it had all the elements of a glossy soap opera and, and they turned it into one. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought, when I started to see the papers, I thought, that's not the woman I know. Mm -hmm. You know, she was a very kind, loving mother. She went through hell getting the twins. She had three miscarriages before she was pregnant with the twins. It became an obsession for her to have children. So to give them up so easily just didn't, didn't make sense. But as I say, I was in shock. So I was kind of believing things, but not believing them. Mm. So when do you, when do you, knowing the, the woman that you see portrayed in the newspaper was not the woman that you knew mm. and what she'd gone through to get those children, um, how long before you realised that everybody was looking, everyone bar that one policeman really, was looking in the wrong direction? Um, I think when we started to see some of the odd behaviour at my flat, because I welcomed Jeremy into my flat and supported him and you know, gave him all the brotherly love that I could as a victim. Um, but then he started to show sort of elements of not really grieving, you know, when it was sort of caught unawares with, with Julie, for example. Mm. Um, and there was a point where he came running up the stairs at my flat with his hair all soaked up and pulled in spikes, he'd just been in the bath, and he, he was copying the photograph of Daniel and Nicholas in the bath. And he came running up the stairs giggling and ran straight into my mother and then went, oh, and st oh, started putting on the whole performance. And I started to hear about that. But it was really after the funeral, once, once uh, June and Neville and Sheila's funeral happened, we were in the car going to the crematorium, and he started larking around with Julie in the front of the car, saying what he'd like to be doing to her later in the afternoon. And, yeah. It was really sick. Yeah. Really absolutely. sick. And I thought there's something weird going on yeah. here. 
Then the next thing I knew, he'd been arrested for the first time, which is when I started writing the book. Mm. And so this book, I mean, this has been so important to you for so many different reasons, actually. Yeah. And one of the huge benefits for you of writing this book was that it finally gave you an outlet, a sort of outpouring Absolutely. for your emotions. Yeah. And I imagine when you started writing, you didn't really realise how important this was going to be. I didn't, no, because... Uh, the initial writing started because a senior police officer said, keep notes of anything you can remember. Mm. And I started writing, and then I was approached by Yvonne Roberts, a journalist at The Observer. And she said, I want to write a book. I, th I said, I think I'd like to have a go at it myself. And she said, well, I'll help you. Mm. So she helped me get started. So the notes that you started the to write, the, notes the diary, into essays, the notes, and cha chapters, and then, and, chapters and, then, and, and then you have a book. And I kind of wrote something like 600 pages and then realised there was an awful lot that wasn't relevant. But I was outside observing. Mm. And it wasn't until I actually accepted that I was part of the drama and I wrote it from being part of the drama and, and it being my own journey that it started to really come together as a very strong book. But you, you, you have to find some sort of peace yourself. Yeah. When you, when you lose three members of your... Well, I mean, you, you lost five members of your family. Yeah. Um, but your but your boys and and, and your and your ex wife. So, so, when you're looking for that piece, um, I was sort of reading this morning where where you went and and you ended up in Virginia. Yes, ended up working with Elizabeth Kubler Ross as a participant on her workshops. Very very powerful process. By then, I'd already found a lot of peace through creative processes like writing, art. Suddenly discovered I was a sculptor. Didn't never made a sculpture in my life and. Um, but with Elizabeth, there was, it was a, an environment, this group workshop where everybody listens to each other's stories. They set very firm boundaries about not talking about others, other people's stories because that's their story, it's not yours, not yours to gossip about. And that safe environment allowed a lot of people to fall apart, Vietnam veterans, uh, families of murder victims, bereaved mothers. And you listen to each other's stories and everybody's buttons get pushed and there's people popping all over the room and there's a, mm. a team of very skilled facilitators to, to catch people and, and help them work through the things as they come up. Um, as I say, I, I had a very profound workshop then and then somebody suggested I do the training. Um, another potter, funnily enough, who was on her staff. And um, so I started training and then after a few years I ended up on Elizabeth's clinical staff. Which, and so then this, this opens, you come back here and, and that's what you do and you start to help many, many other people. I did for many years, ran my own workshops, did a lot of went workshops with men, just men on their own, because that's an environment, very often men won't open up, certainly to start crying. And if there's any women around, everything gets very macho and, and men start competing with each other. So we have an all-male environment and, again, very, very deep work was, was possible. Some of your work that you do is that you find that is really beneficial for, for any kind of trauma or grief is actually... It's, it becomes quite physical sometimes. Yes. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that certainly I found, you know, with, with Elizabeth's workshops, we were smashing up telephone directories. We can't get telephone directories anymore. Um, and, you know, you can, you can rip up a phone book and rage at it, you know, but the whole... Secret is to actually talk in the first person. Mm. So they, they, they call it the empty chair thing. So you, you, the, the bad events live inside you like ghosts. And that ghost can be brought out and sat in front of you and you talk to it in the first person. Mm. So all the rage, bitterness, whatever, can, can be said to that... that you know, as they, in, in, in Elizabeth's workshops, it was phone books. And, and the length of hefty rubber hose to smash up the phone book. A lot of mess, a lot of screaming, a lot of raging. Not everybody's cup of tea. Mm. But then when you get through the rage, then there's just tender feelings and you pick up a, a pillow and then you talk to the hurt child inside you or whatever. And it's the tender feelings. Mm. And that's very powerful. And then this whole bunch of people sitting around watching and they're all in tears. And yeah. then... And but that's the next, when the, the healing next, begins, Yeah, and it? there's that, a kind of a magic when you get a group together. Yeah. Mm. Well, your, thank um, you. Your, uh, your book, In Search of uh, the Rainbow's End, um, uh, as you said, it was 1994, I think you wrote it, didn't you? But you 1994, added, you added yeah, more was the original book. Yeah. And as I say, I started it within, within days of Jeremy's arrest yeah. and then it, was, it took nine years to complete. Did, um, did you find the Rainbow's End? It's inside. We're always looking out for the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow out there somewhere. It's, it's always inside. Mm -hmm. 